welcome to this episode of Journeys. My name is Flo and today I'm with the co-founder and CTO of Faye, Daniel Green. Hi, good day. Hey, um, Daniel, tell us quickly, elevator pitch, what is Faye? What do you guys do? So Faye is travel insurance and travel protection designed for humans. We are easy to purchase and easy to take advantage of travel insurance designed for currently US residents and US citizens traveling anywhere, domestically or abroad. It covers your health, your stuff and your trip. Uh, and we really aim to be there uh, by your side no matter what happens. So whether you're having the best trip of your life and you'd really like some advice on how to make it better, or you're having a terrible day and you need assistance, uh, we are very easily accessible via our mobile app. Uh, and if you need us to, to help you out financially, uh, we can even send a virtual credit card directly to your phone so that we can start uh, paying for things that are covered whilst you're on trip. Perfect. We'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more, but let's do what I always do in these uh, interviews. Let's go back to the old dark ages, to your childhood. Um, yeah, you, 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 uh, you portray it with your accent. You are originally from Australia, correct? That's right. I grew up in uh, Sydney, Australia. Okay. Um, what did you want to be when you were a kid or a teenager? What was kind of, what's your earliest memory of a career that you could uh, think back to? I, I think realistically, I always loved uh, live theater, the entertainment industry. Okay. Uh, all the way back in elementary school, uh, in the, I guess, late 80s, early 90s, part of the sound and lighting team. We got to play with smoke machines. We got to set up lights and big sound systems. And that was something I really loved playing with that equipment. I really loved the fact that you could um, see and hear almost instantly. The it was originally what I saw myself doing forever. Okay. And... Um... And was this something you got into as a, as a career early on? Something that you studied or what was your, what did you study when you grew well, up? I had, I had no background in it. I, I fell into it because I guess one day they were probably asking for volunteers and I would have been all of seven or eight and that sounded like a really fun thing to do to get out of class at school and I, I followed that throughout school. Uh, and then around the time I finished high school, by sheer luck, I managed to talk my way into the national television station and I got myself a job as a, uh, well, you could call it a video engineer, but the reality was my job was when live bands came in and were being recorded, I had to walk behind the cameras and constantly move the cables so the band didn't trip on the cables. This was pre-wireless pre cameras, but it meant that I got to be a meter from bands that I absolutely loved and I was still a teenager, I was still in high school okay. at that at night. Um, and then eventually I managed to move over to the sound, the sound part and my job was to plug in the microphones. I'd love to tell you that I was the sound engineer, I would have been 17, 16 or 17 at the time. <clears throat> but I finished school at three o'clock, I took the bus down to the local television studios and I got to, I got to be within a meter of bands that I sometimes worship working on that show was the best thing ever um and eventually one of them uh, led to a connection with the sydney opera house where i would spend almost a decade working behind the scenes on operas uh, so i that certainly was the original career path even though largely i fell into it i, I studied by correspondence uh computer science had to pick a second major and that seemed like fun. I did that okay. nights and weekends, um, uh, mostly for a university in a different state that I, I almost didn't have to visit. Um, and then a little bit of on-campus learning with a, a partner university, Sydney University, which was close to me. Uh, and I, I loved that world. I really thought that that, I really thought the kind of technical side of theater was where I was gonna stay forever but I didn't appreciate how small an industry it is I, I, was, I was just thinking wouldn't be kind of the possible next step movies because the theater is I think budgets are smaller productions are smaller um, then maybe if you want to evolve and add some proper explosions or something um, you need to move to the movie industry 
Yeah, so I, I learned really early on because that, that first step in that career was, was in television where hmm. um, some of the, the live music was live, right? They, they, the band plays the song and that's it. But I yeah. worked on a few other shows that were more traditional and I didn't necessarily have the patience for 300 takes. Um, it's one of the things you don't see, but sometimes two or three good minutes of television Mm. took an entire day of stopping and starting. And I was really attracted to the idea that when you make a mistake in live theater, you own it, you live with it, and, and you keep going. I mean, I, I started in that industry pretty young. I did any number of stupid things, including plunging the entire uh, opera house into darkness at the wrong time by mm. tripping on a cable like everyone does. <clears throat> and you know, you just, fix it as quickly as you physically can and you laugh about it later and you make sure you never do it again and, and that's live theater um, and the company i worked for built some of the sets for the matrix they built the nebuchadnezzar set so there were plenty of war stories about how that all happened and even though it sounded incredibly exciting uh a good day of shooting on the matrix yielded 30 to 40 seconds of footage and that i guess i didn't have the patience for yeah Sure, very repetitive, very to be very detail oriented, and and stubborn. So I can I can imagine how this after a while can be. Uh, I mean, also in that respect, I think um, we have to admire the work of good actors. If you have to deliver like a scene, an emotional scene, over and over and over again, um, and yeah, and then if you are behind the cameras. You have to watch this again and again and again compared to the life thrill of, of being in the moment. Um, You're exactly right. And, and every night's a little different. And you, you get to enjoy the fact that, that every performance has some unique quality to it. Uh, and, and the feedback is real. I mean, the, the audience doesn't always think about it, but all those bright lights shining on the stage, yeah. they bounce off the stage back into the audience. I mean, the people on the stage can see the audience um, pretty clearly. You can see when people are enraptured. You can see when people are asleep. Yeah. You, can, you can just, you can see the audience. So the best performances I ever witnessed, and, you know, I was I was a technician. I was never on this. I was never performing. Yeah. Um, but the best performances I ever witnessed uh, was was a feedback loop. The performance was good, but the audience was incredibly receptive. And because the audience was receptive, the performers tried a little harder. And as they tried a little harder, the audience got more into it. Yeah. And eventually, um, both the audience and the performers would walk out of that show saying, wow, what an amazing night. But they, they fed off each other's energy. Yeah. There's like two things that pop into my head. One is... There's a comedian that I really like and follow and I consume everything he does. And he came to Barcelona, so I went to see him twice. Because I thought, I'm not going to see, he's American. Um, I don't get that chance quite often, so I just go twice. And I realized that even though the set was the same, there were slight changes. And I realized that he had worked on little details, so the next day would be better. And then I saw the actual recording at the end of the tour, like a Netflix special type. And I realized that it had changed quite a bit. So he used the whole tour to make it perfect. And then at the end to kind of the recording, I thought it was really interesting. And the other thing I just thought of, my wife recently went to uh, see Björk, an artist that she really likes to, in Madrid. And she's seen her yeah, half a dozen times, maybe more. And she said that's the last time because apparently Björk, it wasn't really a concert, it was more like of a performance and she didn't interact with the audience at all. She just went on stage, visuals, almost like a theater type, some acting, music, shows over, thank you, goodbye, walked out and my wife was notably disappointed because that she felt with the artist. So what what you're saying is is I can I can very much understand. Um, I think it, it also happens across their career. There's a jazz singer who I have always really admired, and I remembered uh, earlier on in his career we'd go see him in small basement venues in Sydney, where I guess they could hold maybe 
30 people in the whole venue. Mm. And it really, it felt like a conversation. The whole night felt like a conversation. And now several Grammy Awards later, um, mm. the last time I saw him was, was in a huge concert hall that seated 2,000 people. Yeah. And it wasn't a conversation now, it was a show. It was a great show, he's a wonderful performer. I, I still absolutely love his work. Yeah. But as their career progresses and their fame increases, it's hard to maintain that intimacy you fall in love with at the beginning. Yeah. But you did stuck uh, you did stuck with the opera for a decade, no? Yes. If I look at your, your LinkedIn. That's right. For uh, around eight, nine years uh, in total. Okay. I probably worked on over a thousand performances of opera. Uh, some some operas like La Boheme, I've probably seen 130, 140 times at this point. Okay. Do, do you still go to the opera or like as a... I, occasionally, I, in fact, one of the reasons why I was happy to, to change careers when I did um, was because cynicism was, was setting in. I mean, I was getting to the point where I was not necessarily enjoying the show or the craft anymore. It was yeah. just a job. Um, and, and that wasn't what attracted me to live theater in the first place. I, I loved being in the audience. So. Yeah a year and I will I can't I can't bring myself to hear Love Away ever again but I but there are other ones that I can it, it does some terrible things to you to me Carmen is like 20 minutes of some of the best music on earth mm. but filled with about two and a half hours of filler music in the middle like that's just how it is in my head I've got the scenes that I love and the rest is you just wish you could press fast forward and that's what happens when you see it too many times do you when you go to the opera now or to a performance do you ever catch yourself sitting there going like yeah like um, <laughs> criticizing details i mean i mean still if if you can get into a production you can get into a production it shouldn't matter whether it's amateur or professional mm. but i still find myself walking to a theater and you know looking longingly at the sound system and the lighting rig and, and the console at the back and you know really kind of uh, remembering, remembering that part of the world really mm. fondly. Shaking your head, going like, who set up that rig? Um, being like, oh, it's all computerized now. Look, you just press one button and it does the work for you. I know that's uh, not true, but it's certainly. I started when there were a lot more knobs and levers and less uh, screens involved. No. So then you moved on to a more, more, even more technical role. Programming. Yeah. So I mean, I I was lucky enough to be exposed to computers uh, almost all my life. My father was a computer programmer since before I was born, um, and I used to say to people, "Well, I had the advantage of access to computers at a young age." But that yeah. makes no sense. I had my three-year-old an iPad now. So I guess I guess uh, as a child of the '80s, that was a more impressive statement than it is now. But, sure. You know, I had access. I had access to the internet already in the 80s and through through bulletin boards and emails and and i think my first modem was 5600 boards i mean really in the early days just just through my father and he taught me to program when i was very young yeah. uh, really simple stuff but but gave me the foundation so even even the job at the opera house eventually i was um writing some of the software that we were using uh, to run the shows myself because I knew how and I could build something more custom than what what the company could buy. Um, so when so when I felt like uh, I either had to make a lifelong commitment to theater and actually try and get into one of the more management disciplines, which didn't interest me nearly as much as being kind of in the theater on the stage, uh, or or do something else, programming was the natural next step. Hmm. Um, I still sort of fell into all the jobs that I had, that I had along the way, but it it was logical. It was the skill set I had. I I gotten a degree um, in that discipline by that point, so I liked computers. I was good with them. I enjoyed programming. It seemed like it seemed like a logical sidestep. And I mean, I could see there's some some um, parallels to theater because you're creating scenario um, you're engaging with an audience uh, in, a, in a certain way so there's to a certain extent a parallel um, and then you you set up your own shop for a while no not just for a while for nine years 
organized so, knowledge? Yeah, so I, I guess along along the way, um, like like all good kids that knew a little bit of programming uh, in the 80s and 90s, you always ended up having a side hustle, building websites and solving mm-hmm. problems for people. Uh, and that, that had persisted the whole way through. Um, I mean, even even in the early stages of, of the first major companies, uh, I helped pay the bills of that startup by uh, consulting to companies like ID, IBM and the like because it brought good money in and it was useful to be a jack of all trades mm. uh, in computer programming. And it's fun. It's fun to move from, from one challenge to another. I mean, that also applies uh, to, to travel insurance. Take, take the computer side out of it. Um, a lot of travel insurance is every customer is unique. They have unique needs. Every claim, every request for assistance is unique. There's something really satisfying in that in that challenge. So I, I, I would fix your website. I would set up your Jira. I would customize your wiki um, for several decades now. And, and it was useful to have those, those skills on the site. Another thing that caught my eye, um, you worked with Get. Uh, which I think is a uh, an app for to get mo- uh, um, taxis. Sorry. Yeah, it was a competitor to uh, to Uber. Yeah. Um, it was in London, London, Israel, uh, New York for a while, and a few other places. And you were a gamification consultant. Right. Now my first, my t- first startup uh, was a platform which was large, which was effectively crowdsourcing on steroids. For very large corporations and, and government clients and one of the problems we had to solve really early on was uh, how do you get people you know m- marketplaces are two sides you need to find people who are willing to use your platform and you need to find people who are willing to buy the the output so before we had paying customers how could we how could we get people to interact and use our service and, and play with it and um, I I dived headfirst into the world of gamification. I got to know very well the, the gurus of, of that day um, by the name of Gabe Zickerman and uh, eventually would speak at his conferences and, and through him uh, received an introduction to a few companies that were looking for someone to help them build gamification systems. And one of them was was Get or Get Taxi, they were called then. Okay. Um, and they were trying to figure out uh, there was a choice between Get and Uber and the prices were the same and the service was the same. So they were trying to understand what might be their options for making the experience of using Get more fun and more sticky. Uh, and, and probably one of the, the greatest uh, things we had to get around, um, and I, I shouldn't spoil the secret, but I think most people have figured it out by now. Uh, so taxis are a very regulated space in most countries, sure. um, especially where Get operated. So they wanted to make it that um, if you were a really frequent customer, they would try and send you uh, better cars, maybe a Mercedes instead of a Toyota or a driver that had higher ratings. Um, but the regulation said that was illegal. You actually had to offer the ride all taxis within a certain radius of the user. Yeah. Um, so what we came up with to try and make the experience more fun was if by sheer luck you were assigned a brand new Mercedes, you got a message to say, hey, for being such a loyal customer, we've upgraded your ride. And I suspect after a while, everyone kind of knew what we were doing. Uh, but okay. it was great. I mean, everyone's first experience of that feature was, wow, amazing. I've been uh-huh. upgraded. The system has assigned me a better car. Uh, and when the regulators came knocking, they could still show the code and be like, look, it's just what we're telling them. But actually, we're, we've complied with the rules. Uh, and that was a really that was a fun that was a fun project to be part of. Is that like is that the key difference between gamification and like a good UX? Where good UX, you just it's easy to find your way from A to B to C, whereas gamification, in this process, you get a little yoo-hoo feeling. Yeah, I think different different people have different motivations. I suspect the world's greatest gamification combined with the world's worst UX is not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. Um, but there is a category of regular users of any service that appreciate attempts to make it more fun. Mm. I mean, gamification is often abused in the worst of ways, yeah. but they really tried to learn the lessons of 
frequent flyer programs, some of which have done an amazing job. I, I mean, I have done incredibly stupid things uh, in terms of taking, you know, a nine hour layover instead of a 20 minute layover because it gets me more points, which gets me a better status with the airline, which allows me to check in in the business class line despite flying economy. Um, and that just really shows the power of a good gamification program you can turn something mundane uh, into something a little more fun. But, but only for some people. I know plenty of people who fly all the time and have never signed up to a frequent flyer program in their life and they couldn't care about points. Yeah. And I know people for which it's an obsession. They have spreadsheets. They track it religiously. It, it's almost like it's their side job. Mm. Just to each their own. Interesting. Um, so how... Um, is it now time to jump into... Ah, yeah, Wikistrat. So I'm, I'm reading this out here because I really like this when I read it because it made me like, hold up. Um, so Wikistrat is a global network of subject matter experts that collaborate via a wiki to run forecasting, simulations, strategic planning and war games. Um, I'm with you until the war games. Tell me about the war games or tell me about Wikistrat and then... It's not... It, it's not as exciting as the Matthew Roderick movie uh, uh, in the 80s. But uh, yeah. so, so Wikistrat was my first uh, real entrepreneurial venture. That was the first uh, company that I was a co-founder in. That was what I left theater for. Yeah. Um, I started with, with a, a friend who I had known for many years through university days and, and uh, another a now very close friend and, and still co-founder uh, in Faye. But... Uh, someone who joined us at the time he was a mutual friend of the other colleague we came together uh, and we built a platform that we often think of as, as crowdsourcing on, on steroids i mean it was a platform that allowed uh academic experts and and just people who had a lot of experience in a particular subject to come together very quickly even if they're in different time zones share their thoughts and opinions um and then have that synthesized for a client it was and the way we did it was, was via a wiki, which uh, in those days was a great technology and very in vogue. Uh, Wikipedia was somewhat nascent. The word wiki is just not a wine word for quick. Mm. Um, and and really, the one of one of the best things we could do was was what was called war games, but you can also call it uh, role playing or simulations, right? Yeah. It it doesn't have to have anything to do with war and conflict, like a perfectly standard war game that uh, plenty of companies do uh, in this day and age is they say, okay, what if there's another strand of COVID and everyone has to go home again? Yeah. Um, like, what do we do next? Uh, how do we message it to the company? Uh, what, what does that mean for us? And another valid type of war game is uh, Coca-Cola imagines a world where a small competitor comes up with a direct competitor to Coke, a different type of cola that just explodes in success from a marketing point of view um, and they have to fight to keep their market share and the war game is what do you do next yeah. do you try and buy it what happens if they don't want to sell to you so th those are examples of, of things that you can do um, and really in, in many ways that was the company which which brought us to where we are here conceptually because this was long before COVID before Zoom was an acceptable way to communicate or Google Meet, um, people wanted to meet in person. I mean, they were happy to purchase uh, knowledge and expertise on a global platform, but then they wanted to meet in person. And in many ways, Wikistrat was a travel agency uh, that was moonlighting as a strategic consultancy. Um, Interesting. The, the, number of, the number of times I would spend most of the day working on code and managing the team that was building the platform and then at night taking a panicked phone call from someone who had missed a connection in Istanbul or London and didn't know how to still get to the meeting on time. Um, some of the management really found themselves working as, as travel agents uh, for the staff that were... Um, we constantly had people on the road, but it wasn't always the same people. Okay. We had a platform with tens of thousands of experts, so it wasn't un even if we had people traveling every week, they they might not have been they could have been people who were doing their first trip for us. wasn't necessarily to places with direct flights. They weren't all 
road warriors uh, as it goes uh, and so that was that was a really fun challenge and it was also a really amazing insight into how uh, most people when faced with problems on a trip um, really have such a different emotional reaction to mm -hmm. like when things go wrong in a little, I mean it makes sense right you you lose so much power of control I mean once you pass through security in an airport you, you sort of know deep down you can't really leave you just have to follow the instructions when they tell you to get on the small metal tube that's what you have to do and then you just have to sit in your seat till they tell you you can go to the you know it, it, it does things to us yeah um so when things go wrong the the emotions unbelievably magnified and it would be fascinating to watch someone with two PhDs uh, who's a world-renowned expert in a particular subject um, uh, really struggle to follow basic common sense logic in an airport because the the confluence of events in travel had just somehow broken them and now they had missed their flight and they were just looking to someone to be like just just tell me what to do just help me um, interesting yeah it's 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 very true like uh, travel is still very stressful for many and especially if, if there's some sort of purpose behind it a meeting there's like on, on television years ago when i was living in england there was this show where they had this reality tv i think it was linked to ryanair or easy chat who are known for being very harsh when it comes to a yeah, desk is closing at 11 and if you're not if you're there at 11 01 we're not checking you in and people standing there oh i have to go to my sister's wedding and all this um and yeah i just when you talked about this i immediately thought about scenarios where i felt hyper tense at the airport with this lack of control this perceived lack of control and security is just like yeah drop your pants walk through this tube, put up your hands. It's just like, you're, you're just, yeah. Uh, I, I, I feel it. I feel it every time <clears throat> I cross a border. I, I'm an Australian, right? So Australian passports are usually really well received. We're, we're known for being friendly. Uh, immigration border customs guards are usually um, pretty polite to deal with. Yeah. But, you know, everyone feels that anxiety as they come up to the counter in a foreign country Uh, where, you know, a military official sometimes is saying, well, what are you doing here and how long will you be here for and why have you come today? And and it, you feel <clears throat> some level of tension and anxiety, even if you do it on a weekly or monthly basis, no. because it just doesn't feel natural or normal. Yeah, it's it's a very, very, you're being ripped out of your routine where you're sort of in control. And it's, every time I go to the US, um, I feel so tense at the border because yeah like you mentioned the investigation sort of uh, the entry and typically i'm really lucky because like every other other time i get someone who was stationed in germany so they go ah guten tag herr stich and i was like ah cool he was stationed in germany so he must have good uh, memories of drinking beer in germany and enjoying their time And then I get away with being German and it's the easiest check-in ever. But even if just police stops me on the street and they do a breathalyzer or do they check driver's licenses, it's just like anything could happen. I'm completely out of control. Um, so I, so this, led, this experience with Ricky Strat made you realize all these tra uh, people traveling, there's a an issue that needs to be solved. Is this what led to faith? Yeah, so I, in fact, this was the original version of faith. So in many ways, everything I worked on had, had contributed to this this point. I mean, you grow up in Australia, you understand that we're a long way away from anything. So if you want to yeah. have, if you want to have any sort of international <clears throat> vacation um, other than New Zealand, you're, you're already looking at, you know, a minimum of eight hours flying. You probably have to change planes in a foreign country. So I, I grew up that way. Uh, working in opera, I, the, the opera company was based out of both Sydney and Melbourne. So I would, I would need to move cities a couple of times a year for shows. Um, so I'd always had a love of, of travel and, and uh, fascination. And then I landed in gamification, which is in many ways 
the studies of what airline loyalty programs got right and, and what computer games made fun and applying that to, to the real world. Uh, and then we built Wikistrap where we were constantly flying ourselves, uh, sending other people away. Uh, so when we started Faye, the original version uh, was an AI tool that knew what your travel itinerary and plans was and would kind of detect when things were going wrong and offer you solutions. So we would see that your flight was about to be cancelled, was cancelled, and there's only three seats left on the other flight leaving that day, and we would send you a message saying, there's a 90% chance your flight is cancelled. You can click this link, and it's already going to fill in all your information on EasyJet for a flight leaving in two hours. If you're really stressed, take the gamble. Buy the 80 euro ticket on EasyJet, and if the flight gets cancelled, as we fear it might, then just walk over to the EasyJet uh, gate, and away you go. Um, and we bought that company uh, in December 2019. So obviously the punchline was that despite seeing uh, rapid successful growth, uh, COVID came a few months later and almost everyone stopped flying. Yeah. Um, and the great lesson of that time, because we, we were lucky enough that we, we had raised some money, we had an investor who really... Um, who really believed in us and were saying, I know it's COVID, travel will recover, don't worry about it, keep working on it, we've got you. Um, and people were using the service. They were, they were interacting with us on a pretty regular basis, um, but only a handful of people. So we would every flight pretty much and say, wow, how is that flight? What's it like? What's it like traveling in COVID? We had one person who I think had to, had to go, drove like, he was in Germany, I can't remember which city, but he had to drive five or six hours to get to Frankfurt because it was the nearest city that still had a functioning airport mm. in order to take a flight to close a major business deal. Um, and, and did that really in the height of lockdowns and, and all of the craziness. And afterwards, when we said, we're really glad you used the service, was it helpful? The response was, it was, but... If something went wrong, I kept asking myself, who's going to pay for it? Hmm. Like, maybe instead of paying you $5, I can pay you $500 for all I care. But then at least I know that when things go wrong, you're not just offering me solutions. You're picking the best one. You're paying for it. You're just you're handing it to me. Yeah. Um, and that was when we really understood that the, the best evolution we was uh, not just to be able to be there for you when things might be going wrong, but to also be able to uh, assist you financially. And, and the best way to do that is through insurance. Uh, travel insurance and travel protection, because those are the things where we agree on a set of rules, <laughs> yeah. otherwise known as your product wording. Uh, you you pay a certain amount of money, and then when things go wrong, uh, there there's a budget, so to speak, that will, up to that budget, can pay for things. And, and really, when first launch and COVID was still uh, a much more serious uh, than it is right now, we would have people who were going on what should have been the vacation of a lifetime and spending 14 days in a hotel room in Dublin. And whilst we couldn't fix the fact that their trip had gone sideways, yeah. at least we paid for those 14 days of accommodation. We covered some of their food. We covered them changing their flight. Um, and, and for a lot of people, they were still able to do some sort of a holiday. And, and those people really appreciated that it wasn't just that we could kind of call the hotel and try and deal with things. It was that we also could pick up, to, to a large extent, the tab. Yeah. Uh, okay, that, that helps a lot. Because um, I, I wasn't aware of Faye until recently. And I thought, how does someone go, hey, you know what this world needs? travel insurance and i thought hmm i'm really curious about your story to to understand how it fits in but it makes so much sense with what you're telling me um when did you move to to israel uh so uh, in fact that the the trigger between uh you know, working in opera and, and founding wikishack was i i moved to israel to to start that company um, and so that would have been oh, just over 10 years ago now. Okay. Um, and the, the logic was at the time, 
Israel was much closer to, to Europe. I mean, you know, it's, it's only a few hours from many European cities. Yeah. Um, it was much closer to America. I mean, New York's 10, 11 hours away. Yeah. Um, and if we wanted to build a global startup, it was a country that had um, a really good ecosystem, really good access to, to talent, yeah. uh, good developers, good project managers, was much cheaper. I mean, at the time, Tel Aviv's an expensive city now, but at the yeah. time, it was significantly cheaper to hire developers in Tel Aviv and to rent office space than it was in a city like London or New York or San Francisco. Yeah. Um, so it seemed like a, a great adventure to be had. Um, and then the assumption was that, you know, we could we could always move. I mean, we could always relocate the company to, to another city later on, but it was a great place to get started. Yeah. We just sort of fell in love with the... Uh, Tel Aviv is a whole city on the beach, so we just fell in love with the Mediterranean sure. Mediterranean beach lifestyle that, that came, the, the culture where everyone worked incredibly hard, but then went and had a beer on, on the beach at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, it, so one thing led to another, and, and without intending to, um, over a decade later, I'm still here, and, and when it was time to, to start the second coming, it was time to start Faye. Um, the agreement was was much the same. Uh, we can we we can always relocate later, and we might relocate later. But for now, uh, why would we give up on on and the easy access to exceptional talent? Um, I I read a LinkedIn post uh, now that there's a war in your in your country. Um, I know you've got kids. Is your is your partner from from Israel? No, no. She's, okay. Uh, she's originally from the U.S. I mean, we met. We like like all good like all good marriages these days. We met online. Okay. Um, and we just both happened to be living and working here at the time. Because I remember back when I lived in London, I I remember one day I put on uh, television and there was a an IRA bomb attack in London, and then a couple of days later I went to a, a concert. And then walking back to uh, uh, the metro station, I walked past a house that looked like a pub and it was boarded up. And it was really, it looked weird, like messy from the outside, darkish, uh, like a Gotham building out of a Batman movie or something. And all with plywood boarded up. And as I was driving home in the metro, I realized, hey, that was the pub where the car bomb went off a couple of days ago. And that's why the building looked like this. And this really hit me that I'm now living in a city where there's bomb attacks. I'm from countryside Germany, probably most sheltered place in the world. And now I suddenly lived in a place where back then, yeah, once in a while there were bombs going off. And for me, it was so weird, especially because I didn't have any skin in the game. I was completely disconnected to this conflict. How, how is that for you, uh, living in a country where you, you live with an iron dome and sirens going off? So, firstly, I, I think, you know, the attacks of September 11 happened uh, when I was still in high school, yeah. like a senior in high school. Um, so it was a pretty influential moment in feeling like... Um, Wherever you live in the world, there's always going to be the possibility of, of being affected by, by terrorist events. Um, as Sydney hosted the 2000 Olympics, it was regularly in the news that they had uh, discovered, I mean, at one point they discovered a, a terrorist training camp that built mock suburbs of Sydney um, and they had been training for attacks. And, and fortunately, they had been caught, you know, in the planning stages, and we were very lucky to, to not experience um, what, whatever they were planning. Yeah. But you know, I can I compare I compare that even to the risk of being hit crossing the road looking the wrong way, and, and the tragedy of school shootings in the U.S. And I, I, I really I really do come from that background yeah. of um, we live in a day and age of of crazier risks than we appreciate. If we look at the statistics, it's the same as people being afraid to fly, but it's much more dangerous to get in a car or across the road. Um, that said, uh, you know, the events of October 7 were devastating. Yeah. Uh, we were 
very, very lucky to not be um, directly impacted in that we weren't we weren't in one of the affected communities and, and none of our uh, immediate families were. But obviously, everyone living here feels uh, some some connection. You you know, I mean, so many people were affected. You you know, someone you're always uh, two two degrees away from someone who was kidnapped, someone who was affected. Um, uh, we have had to we have had to seek shelter once in a while, grab the kids and move to somewhere safe because you you hear the siren. Um, but it still doesn't change the fact that resilience, in some ways, is also about um, being able to cope with these events and mm. then understand that life goes on. I think COVID also taught yeah. that. Yeah. So it it becomes possible to understand that terrible things are happening sometimes even around you to to feel a sense of heartbreak when you read about casualties and death and in this case on, on both sides i mean like heartbreaks for both sides of this this equation but but also to see the posters of the kidnap and think oh my god i will sleep so much better when these people are brought home and then you hug your kids a little bit tighter mm. but but i just don't know in, in 2023 as we're talking but I, I've always lived in major cities I, even if I wasn't to live here I would live in another major city and living in major cities comes with uh, uh, very small risks but risks of very terrible things happening I, I, I think that exists everywhere I think that that's a really really interesting point um, every time I travel for work my wife gets a bit kind of anxious and it's like oh send me a message when you land and I once made the mistake that was back in the day when I had an office job uh, and I went to this office job on a daily basis with a motorbike on a very busy road in in, in um, the rush hour. And I told her, listen, it's, I'm probably at more risk every day when I go to the office than when I take a flight to London. Flying is the safest uh, way of transportation. And she didn't appreciate that, that I told her that actually my daily life is the, my risky one and not the, um, the once a month flight to London. Um, but you're right. And living, living in a city um, bears at risk. Living a life bears at, at risk. And apparently most, most accidents happen at home, they say. Um, but I think it's definitely an interesting, interesting scenario when... I imagine you coding away, thinking of gamifying your insurance service and sirens go off and you go like, well, okay, I'll finish that later. Crap the kids off to the shelter and then I'll do some more business later on. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, very unfortunately, the times we live in. Yeah, and you know, we learn from, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're lucky enough that we have uh, a workforce. So we're... Yeah. We're protected by a lot of this anyway. We have a large operation inside the US. Um, but, you know, we also look at uh, people we know who were working in places like the Ukraine um, when war broke out there. And it's, or you look at you look at how people responded in the first week of COVID yeah. to like the third month. It's, it's just amazing how quickly uh, humans can adapt to a new situation uh, and find ways to be productive. Yeah. And in that, resilient but i think um humans overall are just way more resilient than we realize yeah yeah um as we come to the end of the interview um where's daniel green in a decade or two uh when you're when you're maybe coming to a, a close of your career what do you see yourself doing in the in the distant future i, I think there's a lot to do in this this space i mean i'm really passionate about travel um and, and even if i fell into travel insurance i i really i really can't imagine that humans are going to have any less desire for travel 10 years from now than they will now and in regulated environments things move a little slowly anyway so if there is ever going to be a quest for global domination of travel insurance and the like and really appreciating that you know, we take it, we take the ability to travel for granted. I mean, look at what happened after COVID and this concept of revenge travel. Mm. Um, 
I, I love this space. The travel industry hospitality is filled with the most amazing people, many of whom share that exact same passion. I mean, they work in the space, but it started because deep down they just love travel or people or, or that that aspect. Um, and so it really does, only a couple of years in fact, it really does feel like we're just getting started. And, and I very comfortably and confidently can imagine a future 10 years from now uh, where we're doing exactly what we do now on a much bigger scale, uh, in more languages with more people and, and the excitement and headaches that come along with that. Perfect. Some great final words. Uh, Daniel Green, CTO and co-founder of Faye. Uh, check them out. Daniel, thanks so much for your time Thank and you uh, hope to see you face to face at some point. Absolutely.